Hello everyone and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica, I'm the director of Planetarium and with me tonight are two students and one of our other directors um, who is joining us. I will let everyone introduce themselves and we'll start with Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. Uh, I'm Eli. I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. I'm Jim, and uh, I'm the director of Indigenous Programming. Um, star stuff are us. <laughs> so tonight, uh, as you might be able to tell, we are joined by uh, a special guest here. And Lindsay's got a couple of her own as well. Um, but tonight we are talking about the very fun, interesting, hotly debated topic of aliens. Uh, is there life out there and what might it look like? Um, so, as always, as I'm getting everything set up here, if you have any questions for us throughout the show tonight, feel free to leave them down in uh, the comments. Eli is going to keep an eye on that for me and will let me know as questions come up. Uh, and we'll also have time at the end to answer questions as well. Um, but let's get into this. Uh, so we are talking about aliens. Are there aliens out there? And we're going to start off with a little bit of kind of history behind aliens as we think of them. Because for most people, when you say the word alien, they tend to think of the little green man, the, the stereotypical Martian. Um, there are a couple of other common um, characteristics or, or, or descriptions that are becoming more common as well. Um, but they all tend to be kind of humanoid-ish. You've also got kind of the debate between the little green man or the like kind of silverish looking alien. Uh, if you're a fan of classic movies, there's also the alien from Alien. Uh, great movie, just watched it again the other night. Um, but a lot of this kind of humanoid depiction, especially that classic little green man, um, has an interesting history to it and is really traced back to a, a mistranslation. Um, so to, to kind of look at this, we're going to go back to the late 1800s. Uh, there was an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiaparelli, who was making a map of features that he saw on the planet Mars. And he saw these long kind of linear features across the surface, and he called them canali which in Italian means channel. But when his work got translated from Italian to English, um, that word canali was mistranslated to mean canal. And that may not seem like a significant difference, but there is actually a, a difference between the two because channels are natural features that are just commonly created by moving water whereas canals are specifically man-made features. And so by mistranslating this and calling these features canals, you were implying that there was an intelligent race on Mars that built these waterways. And a lot of astronomers saw these linear features and this idea of canals on Mars spread. Uh, and so it kind of became commonplace that there must be an intelligent race on Mars, some intelligent Martians, that have built this system of canals across the, the surface of Mars. Uh, and it was commonly thought that they were building these to bring water from the polar caps, because we see Mars does have polar ice caps, um, to bring water from the polar caps down to the kind of equatorial region. And one of the people who is most well known for popularizing this idea, especially to the general public, was a man named Percival Lowell. Uh, he went so far as to build an entire observatory just to study these canals on Mars. He wrote books, he gave lectures, he is kind of one of the big voices behind the canals on Mars, and as I said, making this public knowledge. 
And once it became known by the public, it really took off from there. We have books all about it. Um, one of the more famous ones being um, the John Carpenter series by Edgar Rice Burroughs. And this was actually the first depiction of a Martian where they used the little green man stereotype. And that's where our idea of the little green Martian comes from is Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, but by this point, it was so well known that people just accepted it. There were Martians. There was intelligent civilizations on Mars. And that, of course, once that knowledge became accepted, led to the fear of, are we going to be attacked? Are they, you know, are they nice or are they hostile? What's going to happen? But it was pretty just well known that they existed and they were out there. But all of that changed in the 1960s, uh, 1965 to be exact, when we had our first spacecraft do a close-by flyby of the planet Mars and sent us back the first close-up clear images of the surface. And it turns out there are no canals. Uh, those features that astronomers like Shia Pirelli and Lowell were seeing were really just random features across the surface that our brains like to take random bits of information and make some sort of pattern or order out of them. And so our brains connected that into a linear type feature, which was called a channel and then mistranslated to a canal and then everything blew out of proportion. And so 1965, we realized, no, we were wrong. Uh, there are no canals. There are no immediate evidence of there being an intelligent race on Mars. Um, but I still think that our excitement um, and our yearning to know if there is life out there really was, I won't say exacerbated, but was, was really carried forward by all of this excitement with Mars. Uh, and so we now have this idea of aliens and intelligent life as a very common theme in science fiction. Um, one thing to think about, though, is this alien life that's depictured, depicted is usually a form of advanced intelligent life. But if we think about it, most of the life here on Earth is not like that. Most life on Earth is not advanced, and most is certainly not intelligent. Uh, there are arguments to be made about whether humans are intelligent life or not, but we will not get into that fully. Um, so when we're thinking about life, it's important to think about all kinds of life that can be out there. The most common type of life we have here on Earth is microscopic life. Things like bacteria, or uh, here we have a close-up here on the left of a little uh, mealworm, which I think just looks really cool. But this is the kind of life that is most prominent and existed for the longest amount of time here on Earth. So when astronomers and scientists talk about finding aliens or finding life elsewhere, we mean this type of life as well. And in fact, we would be very excited to find single-celled life on another world because that's, that's still life. That's still proof that life can develop elsewhere. Uh, and so to kind of get into this a little bit more, our really basis for how life develops and what life needs to develop is our own planet, planet Earth because it's the only place we know of as of yet that life has developed. And so that can give us some clues into how common the process might be, how difficult it might be, and what sort of properties need to be, uh, need to be there in the world in order for this life to develop. So looking at our own Earth, we find the very earliest uh, fossil evidence of life states back to about 3.5 billion years ago, which is about a billion years after the Earth had formed. Uh, and we see lots of fossil evidence from this time. Um, you're seeing here on the right, one of these types uh, is very similar to the stromatolites that we see today. Uh, it's this form of kind of bacterial life that forms these layered structures. 
And based off of the fact that we find fossils like the stromatolite that date back to 3.5 billion years ago, we know that life had to be pretty thriving by that point, which means it actually developed a little bit earlier. Uh, it's actually very possible that life developed as early as 4 billion years ago, right when the first oceans formed on the Earth. It's possible that deep in those oceans near volcanic vents, the very first life was able to develop. Um, now, it's possible it stayed underwater for a long time, especially in the very beginning, because we had lots of impacts happening very early on, and that could have made surface life a lot more dangerous. Um, but this is how we think it started. Somewhere between three and a half to four billion years ago, the first life developed on Earth, and it was this microscopic form of life. Um, another interesting thing to know is at this time, life actually wasn't dependent on oxygen because there was no oxygen yet in Earth's atmosphere. This early life lived off of carbon dioxide because that's what was prominent in the early atmosphere. Oxygen life didn't really come about until we started having oxygen in our atmosphere. And that started about 2.7 billion years ago when um, a form of cyanobacteria, which is photosynthetic life, takes carbon dioxide uh, and uses that to produce energy and a byproduct of that process is oxygen. And as this photosynthetic life developed, it started producing oxygen as this byproduct, which allowed oxygen to slowly build up in our atmosphere. Uh, and so it took a long time, as you can see here, from when this photosynthetic plant life started until we reached present levels, which was about 500 million years ago, uh, before we got to, to present levels uh, that we have in the atmosphere today. And right around that time is when we saw an explosion in the amount and diversity of life. We call this the Cambrian explosion. And though we don't fully know what caused it, it and Jim, you may know more about this than I do. Um, I, I do think, or I believe that we know that it is probably tied to the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere and the development of oxygen-based life. Um, so I think using oxygen instead of carbon dioxide allows for larger and more complex organisms. Is that correct? I don't know if any of you. Yeah, I think <clears throat> there's several factors I've heard discussed. Uh, a lot of things involve the um, volume to surface area of a life form as well and uh, transport across uh, the membrane, you know, as we would think of it like skin, but uh, how things get inside, outside. And, um, but I, I think I, I look at the biochemistry also of some really amazing structures called porphyrin molecules. They uh, involve usually 20 carbons. They kind of look like pieces of soccer balls, uh, hexagon pentagons, and um, they have four or eight, uh, sided symmetry, you might say, sort of like a compass shape, north, south, east, west, and then northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest. Uh, the 20 carbon atoms are kind of in a ring shape. And then there's uh, four nitrogens and then one atom at the center. And uh, often case that, that one at the center is either an iron ion um, or magnesium. And if it's magnesium, you basically have the green stuff of chlorophyll. And then when the iron is in there, it's heme. If you have four of those hemes and a bunch of protein to wrap them together, that's perhaps hemoglobin. So the role of the cyanobacteria um, and these um, life catalysts, these uh, energy transformers, you know, they can take in ultraviolet light and, and bounce electrons around and they can make and break electrical bonds. So all of that is kind of complicated in terms of how um, even in photosynthesis, how uh, oxygen uh, and respiration, oxygen carbon dioxide shift. We know it took uh, at least what is a billion years for the atmosphere to shift from, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to remember now, maybe it was a couple of billion. <laughs> it was, from, it was at least a billion. Yeah. Yeah. From CO2 to O2. Mm -hmm. 
And then ozone. Oh, the other factor I would say, you need an ozone shield because if you don't have O3, then the ultraviolet from our nearest uh, sun, the star, uh, can break those bonds in a self-replicating type of molecule like uh, RNA, DNA, you know, protein chains, peptide links. Too much uh, ultraviolet energy can, can break the long, delicate polymers, I guess. Yeah, and that would also allow for, again, that more diverse and also allow for more land-based life yeah. as opposed to the predominantly uh, ocean-based life Protected that had existed the water, before. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even still up to 500 million years ago, as we're seeing on this timeline, and I kind of moved my video so you could see it a little bit better, um, we're still looking at pretty simple forms of life until that Cambrian explosion. Life started to get a little bit more complex, started to diversify, but we still have a long time period before things like mammals and dinosaurs came about. Uh, mammals and dinosaurs didn't exist until about 250 million years ago. And for about 100 million years, the world was dominated by the dinos. Mammals stayed pretty small, uh, rodent-like, and didn't really grow or diversify, likely because dinosaurs were the prominent uh, life form, the prominent predators, and mammals just didn't have the, the um, availability, not availability, the chance, we'll say the chance to really diversify because they were not the, the dominant species. That all changed, of course, about 65 million years ago when uh, the big uh, impact event happened that led to uh, major mass extinction events that killed off the dinosaurs. And really that moment was what allowed mammals to become the king of the species. It allowed mammals to finally start to grow and diversify. Uh, and led to the mammal reign that we have today. Uh, but even then, we only appeared not that long ago. So again, looking back at the kind of types of life that have existed, while life formed possibly pretty early on, it stayed very simple for the bulk of Earth's history. And it's only recently that we've started getting that more complex uh, humanoid type of life, intelligent life. Uh, so when looking for life elsewhere, we're probably a lot more likely to find that simple microscopic life than we are to find more complex intelligent life. So based off of what we have learned from here on the earth, we have kind of a few requirements that we look at for life possibly being able to develop on the surface of another world. Um, one of those things is water, liquid water specifically, because every form of life that we have found here on Earth relies on liquid water. And so that seems to be absolutely key. That needs to be present. Uh, another thing is having an atmosphere. Um, as Jim was saying, um, having ozone in our atmosphere helps protect the surface from UV light. Uh, that atmosphere is also what provides either like the carbon dioxide for carbon dioxide based life or oxygen for oxygen based life. Uh, so having an atmosphere appears to be uh, critical for surface life. Uh, and then one other thing we haven't talked about is the presence of something called a magnetic field. Uh, and this magnetic field acts as a shield that protects the planet from the wind of stream or the stream of charged particles that comes from stars. And that stream of charged particles, uh, because it's so fast and energetic, can cause mutations and disruptions in life if it's able to reach the surface of the world. And a magnetic field acts like a shield and blocks that from happening. And so it's another factor on top of the, the ozone layer that helps to protect the surface life and allow it to really uh, become more complex uh, because it's able to build and grow without being broken apart by high energy light or high energy particles. And so based on these requirements, we are able to look at other planets other than Earth 
and look at this kind of checklist of what we think we need for life to develop on the surface of the world. And we're able to get a list of places that we think are possibly habitable. So in order to look for places that uh, could have liquid water, uh, we need to look at where the planet is orbiting around the star that it's orbiting around. Uh, because how close or far away it is, is going to determine the temperature of the planet, which will determine whether water is in a liquid state or frozen or a gas. Uh, and so we look for this region around a star that we call the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. It's where the temperatures are just right too close, the planet's too hot, and that water is going to be vaporized, it's going to be water vapor. Too far away, temperatures are too cold, and that water is going to be frozen. And you have to be right in just the right spot for the temperatures to allow for the water to be liquid. And you can see that the, the area that is that Goldilocks zone kind of varies depending on how hot the star is. Hotter stars, that zone is going to be a bit further out because the star itself is hotter. Cooler stars, that zone is going to be closer to the star. And so we can take a look at what type of star is there and how far away the planet is. And that tells us if it falls within this Goldilocks zone. Um, another thing that we look at is the size of the planet itself because this is going to help determine whether it has an atmosphere and has a magnetic field. And so there is actually a too big and a too small for surface life on a planet. Uh, if you get much smaller than the planet Mars, um, so we're thinking like the size of our moon, then that world is just not massive enough. It doesn't have a strong enough gravity to hold on to an atmosphere and it's not going to have an atmosphere. It's inside is also not going to stay hot enough for very long to create that magnetic field. So those really, really small worlds, smaller, a little bit smaller than Mars, we'll say, and smaller on, um, are just too small for life to possibly survive on the surface because it doesn't have that protection of the atmosphere and the magnetic field and all of that stuff. But then if we think too big, um, if we start looking into like Jupiter-sized worlds, those worlds don't have a solid surface. Uh, and so there's not really a surface for life to develop on. There, there are more debates that could be had, but we're just going to say that when looking for the surface life, we're really wanting to look for something maybe a little bit bigger than Earth to down to a little bit smaller than the size of Mars. Uh, and so that gives us our criteria. We need a planet that is just the right distance from its star and that falls in the size range. And that means it's likely to have Earth-like characteristics and possibly have what's needed for life to develop there. Now within our own solar system, we have a planet that kind of fits that. And that is the planet that started off our discussion tonight and started off kind of a lot of this hype around aliens, and that's the planet Mars. Uh, now, today, Mars isn't fit for life, but we have a lot of evidence that early on, Mars was a lot more Earth-like, that it had a much thicker atmosphere, much warmer temperatures, and had a lot of surface water early on. And so it is possible that in that time when Mars was more Earth-like, life could have developed there. And that's one of the main missions of uh, the new Perseverance rover is to look for that, to look for any signs that life did develop during that time when Mars was more Earth-like. Looking past our own solar system, we have found many other planets around other stars that fit this criteria and are potentially habitable exoplanets, uh, planets that are Earth-like in nature. Um, we have, last I checked, approximately 55 um, that fit the, the criteria that we mentioned being you know, the right distance from their star and the right size, and here's several of them here. 
Um, the very closest to being Earth-like is uh, Kepler 186F, uh, which you can see here, very, very close in size to the Earth, and uh, being uh, its distance from its star makes its temperatures very Earth-like as well. Uh, the closest possibly habitable planet to us is uh, Proxima Centauri b, which is an exoplanet around the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri. Uh, and then another interesting type of possibly habitable exoplanet is Kepler-22b, which appears to be a giant water world. Um, it looks like it might be a water or a world that's just a, a giant ocean, which given that life first developed in oceans and spent a lot of its time in oceans, that seems very good and possible that life could end up developing there. So as far as looking at things like Earth and having life develop like it did here on Earth and thrive and live on the surface of the planets, there are a lot of options out there. Uh, now, we can't say definitively yet that any of these potentially have the world do have life. Um, but it's one of the future goals as we continue to build bigger and better telescopes and bigger and better instruments, we'll be able to get much more detailed look at these exoplanets and hopefully find signs that there is life. For example, finding an abundance of oxygen, right? That didn't happen for Earth until photosynthetic life developed. So if we see a lot of oxygen in another planet's atmosphere, that is likely a very good indicator that there is photosynthetic life there. Uh, there's also ratios of things like methane that indicate life. Um, there is, uh, I believe in the infrared, um, chlorophyll gives off a, a unique signature in infrared light. Uh, that could indicate that there is chlorophyll and therefore photosynthetic life. So we have lots of ways and clues that we're looking for. We're just waiting for our technology to let us really explore this further. But there's even more that could be there. This is only that we've looked at so far, life that could live on the surface of a world. But what if we're not... Uh, restricted to just the surface. Because there are a lot of places in our own solar system that have vast oceans of liquid water underneath their surface. Uh, and the most prominent one of these is, Euro is uh, the moon Europa, which is one of Jupiter's moons. Um, it has an icy crust. We don't expect there to be life on the surface because it's too cold, no atmosphere, all of that. But underneath that icy crust sits a huge ocean of liquid water that also has probably things like volcanic vents at the bottom as well. And again, that's where life first developed here on Earth. So life could possibly be here on Europa. Um, and one of the reasons we really like Europa is the amount of water. It turns out Europa might actually have twice the amount of water in its ocean than we have here on Earth. That's a huge ocean of liquid water, which makes it very, very prominent and, and likely as a source of other life. Uh, and NASA and the European Space Agency are working on future missions to go and explore that ocean beneath that icy crust and see if life is actually there. Europe is not the only world in our solar system that has a subsurface ocean. Uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus has a subsurface ocean. Neptune's moon Triton also has a subsurface ocean. So these are other places where we might find life underneath the surface. Um, now, as far as extending this beyond our solar system, that's where we kind of draw the line. Because uh, we can't really explore underneath an exoplanet surface without either sending a spacecraft there or going there ourselves. And we just don't have the technology yet to do that. So when looking at planets outside of our solar system, worlds outside of our solar system, that's why we focus on surface life. 
but we explore the possibility of subsurface life in worlds in our own solar system because we can explore those. Um, another possible thing to consider is maybe life doesn't have to have liquid water. Maybe it could thrive on another type of liquid. And in fact, the uh, Saturn's largest moon, Titan, has liquid on its surface, but it's liquid methane. So maybe there's some form of life on Titan that develops to live off of liquid methane instead of liquid water. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we have uh, the Dragonfly mission uh, that, when did we say, Lindsay? 2027, I believe, uh, is when it's supposed to launch and head to Titan. And it's a little copter that can fly around because Titan has a thick atmosphere, so it can fly through it, uh, and is going to explore this possibility further of what conditions are like on Titan and if, if there is any weird type of life there. Um, now, going one step even further, could life exist just floating around in space, not in a planet or underneath the surface of a world? Well, Maybe. There are these cute little, and I call them cute, some people think they're creepy, these what we call extremophiles that we have found here on Earth called tardigrades that are resilient little creatures. They can survive very, very high temperatures, cold temperatures, high acidity, high salinity, um, high, or no, um, low pH, would that be very basic? I don't know. Um, and they have even survived the vacuum of space. We sent these little suckers outside while they were up on the International Space Station, left them out there for several minutes and brought them back in, and many of them survived. Uh, so maybe there's little tardigrade-like extremophiles that are just floating around in space as well, just waiting to land somewhere uh, where they can then start to thrive and prosper. Um, I always just like talking about tardigrades, so uh, I like I like ending it there. Um, Actually, also on the Star, Star Trek, a uh, um, couple years ago, they used that idea that there was uh, actually a very large tardigrade uh, that they beamed aboard the ship, and uh, it was able to give them some technology for uh, um, navigating wormholes. <laughs> oh, interesting. I did not know that. But um, with all of that said, and you now have a, a little bit of a look at kind of how life developed here, what life might look like elsewhere, and where we're searching, um, we want to leave you with our own final thoughts of, is there life out there? Um, I will start. I think, uh, yes, statistically, billions of stars all at least half with planets, many of that, about 20% of those being Earth-like, meaning it's right, same size, same temperature, and how quickly life developed here on Earth. Yeah, I think it's out there. Um, now, whether it's intelligent, don't know. Whether we'll ever communicate with it, don't know. Space is a huge place. Um, but I personally think it's out there. Lindsay, what do you think? Uh, well, as you said earlier, um, the only reason, at least as far as we know, there could have been other reasons if this hadn't happened, but the only reason that mammals and then therefore humans were able to exist is because of the um, extinction of the dinosaurs. So maybe aliens look more like dinosaurs than humans? It's possible. Yeah. They also have lived a lot longer than humans have so far. They were around for so long. Yeah. Eli, what do you think? I, I, I'm with you, Jessica. I think it's definitely, I, I think it, there's just too much out there for it not to be, but I, I also think there are just kind of too many barriers working against us to find it, such as, you know, if it is out there, it's probably too far away for us to reach in a timely manner before we're extinct or, and then the other thing is that I always think about is like, I don't know, the universe has been and will be around for a long time. So if it is out there, who says that it's going to be at the same time that we're going to be around here too, if it is accessible to us. 
So I think it's definitely out there. And if it's not, it definitely will be at some point, but whether we'll ever see it or communicate with it or encounter it is probably less, much less likely in my opinion. Yeah. Jim, what do you think? Yeah, well, a long time ago, uh, I could tell you how long ago it was like, uh, what, 1980? <laughs> uh, my astrophysics professor was one of the guys that uh, knew, of course, Carl Sagan and, uh, and a guy named Frank Drake. And um, I believe he was in the room when 12 of those folks came up with an equation called the Drake equation, where they basically came up with seven different numbers you multiply together that would, could possibly tell you how likely uh, is life in our galaxy. And um, what's kind of fascinating is in all those years, uh, 60 years actually, uh, since 1961, um, we've now got better boundary conditions and measurements um, on those variables. But the overall number is still about the same, something like 10,000, maybe 100,000. Um, intelligent you know, life forms uh, still out there uh, now, if they're able to communicate with, uh, you know, at a distance, like with the speed of light, we would think like radio, television, uh, whether we think of it that way or not, we've been sending out our information <laughs> uh, since we had television. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot to think about. I kind of like the men in black stuff. Of course, uh, you got to be careful about the science fiction, but, uh, you know, look at the Look at the variety, the biodiversity on our planet. I put up a, a timber rattlesnake here just because uh, they're so amazing. They see infrared, they can see heat. And I kind of go along with what Lindsay was saying is that uh, these creatures that were around and basically were able to stay around even after the dinosaurs, uh, things like turtles, some think birds are actually, you know, the, the remnants of the dinosaurs. Um, and, and um, once life is able to be on a planet, uh, if, if that planet has gravity, of course, um, they sort of have this chemical awareness of um, up and down and mobility and um, the ability to pass itself on. So plants, for example, let me switch my background picture here. Plants have uh, uh, chemicals called auxins and an auxin lets it know, again, direction, up from down, which, which way do the roots go, which way do the, you know, the light gathering uh, leaves and stems and so forth. So I just find it amazing that some of the oldest life forms on our planet are these, you know, boxy cell structures, uh, the redwood trees, the sequoias, the baobabs, the, um, so yeah, I, I, of course, I really do believe there's life out there. Why haven't we heard from it yet. Um, uh, a couple people you probably know of, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking and another person who's still alive here, Dr. Michio Kaku, they both say maybe we shouldn't be trying to contact them and maybe it's okay to kind of hide in the shadows. Maybe we're not that far along and we don't want to be contacted by our older uh, uh, siblings or relatives. <laughs> So uh, we, we don't have a definitive answer for you um, of if there is alien life out there, uh, but if it is, which most of us think that it probably is, you now have a little bit of an understanding of what it might look like and what it takes for that life to develop. Uh, Eli, did we end up with any questions? Um, we got a couple comments. Um, when we were talking about the life forms, we got acute and uh, megalodons and leoplerodons. I don't even know what that second one is. I'm probably going to look it up after this. Orthodonts? Time. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, then we got one when we find life on another planet. Uh, we've got someone confident here. Maybe we need that confidence in this group. Um, would that life form be brought back to Earth? Hopefully not. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say hopefully <laughs> not for many, many reasons. Most, most being taking them out of their planet drastically decreases their chance of surviving. Yeah. Yep. Also, again, if you've seen Alien. Yeah. <laughs> oh, if I really want to. Don't, don't go touching random stuff. Yeah, just... no, I don't want to. Yeah. 
I don't want to become Sigourney Weaver. Well, not in that series, but I would. That's how we got to be really careful when we are visiting places that we think might have life in our solar system, like Europa. We have to really make sure that there isn't any life hanging out on there from Earth because it could really disrupt any of the life that's on Europa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of things in there and Ideally, it would be sending, like she was saying, uh, sterile instruments and sterile robots to learn more about it there, but not actually bringing anything back ourselves or going there ourselves, honestly. One thing humans... to remember that gives me a lot of hope, and that is uh, when I said star stuff are us at the beginning. Um, in my Dakota language, we say, uh, the stuff of stars we are. And that's because this picture behind me here, when uh, when stars are at the end of their, their lifetime, and that depends on their size and composition, but uh, they can go nova or supernova. And this one is actually the true heart of the north uh, circumpolar region. Uh, it's not Polaris or Thuban or Vega. It's uh, This is called NGC 6543 or Cat's Eye Nebula. And what I love is that uh, the periodic table of elements is made. Um, stars blow out star dust, which are the atoms in our body. So um, red giant stars, when they go, they, you know, they blow out the carbon atoms, like little soccer balls again, uh, 60 carbon atoms at the corners of a, a soccer ball shape, uh, which the rest of the world calls football shape and which chemists call Buckminster Fullerene uh, after a, an architect guy, philosopher. So I think there's plenty of uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, hydrogen, CHNO. If you're from Minnesota, we say it's CHNO, don't CHNO, CHNO. And then if you add in some, you know, phosphorus and sulfur, uh, CHNOPS, CHNOPS, uh, basically, you know, 99% of your body are about 13 elements, I guess, something like that. So atoms know how to put themselves together. So life has a, a pretty good uh, way of, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not saying there isn't a recipe or a, a chef or uh, an architect, a cosmic uh, design, but um, maybe the design is just that stars will make us and therefore remake us. We're recycled stardust. So I think there are relatives out there. I always like thinking about that and us being stardust. All right. Um, any other questions? No other question, but um, we did get one comment. Um, well, I suppose it's a question. Um, if there were life in other places in the universe, uh, would there be birthdays? Um, you know, like say on Friday, um, happy birthday, Jessica. Happy Is that from my dad. Birthday. Thank yeah, you, dad. I believe so. Is your dad's name Chuck? <laughs> Yes. Hi, Dad. Happy <laughs> birthday. All right. Thank Great you. <laughs> um, to actually try and answer the question, uh, I guess that comes down to a life forms, how they keep time. I mean, I would oh. assume any form of intelligent life would be interested in keeping time. One way to do that would be your revolution around your star, which is what a birthday is. So, yeah. Possibly. Birthday. Happy early. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the circle around the sun. Yes. <laughs> um, so before we head out, a um, couple of things coming up on Saturday, we are doing another edition of Ask an Astronomer. So if you have questions, we hopefully have answers for you. Um, and then next week, we are going to be doing kind of a, a fun, fun theme um, since the weather is starting to get uh, a bit better, we're able to go outside more. Uh, we want to do um, two shows kind of around that. So on Wednesday, we'll talk about uh, telescopes uh, for anyone interested in maybe getting your first telescope or how to use your first telescope. And then on Saturday, uh, we're going to tell you all about uh, astrophotography and how you can start out taking pictures of the night sky. Um, which doesn't require a telescope. Lindsay's going to tell us all about that. Think. Yeah, a lot easier than you think. Um, last thing, of course, uh, you've heard it a few times, but we have Astronomy Day coming up on May 22nd. 
Um, we will be outside the planetarium from 2 to 4 p.m. with lots of fun stuff going on, including handing out activity kits uh, for you to take home and be an astronomer on your own at home. Uh, there will also be a virtual component that night as well, since we typically stream on Saturday nights. Uh, but mark your calendar. You can also find a link to the Facebook event in the video description. Um, but if that's it, we will wrap it up there. We went a little long tonight, but this is always a fun topic to talk about. Uh, so thank you everyone so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye everyone.